wherever you want, sweetheart. Looks like right there's a spot. Maybe I should move a hand up forward to front. Probably. Why? All right, I want to welcome everybody to the. Uh, Oriana House Recovery Day event. I just want to thank family and friends for coming out to support their family members that are with Oriana House. Uh, my name is Seth Barnes. I'm a lead treatment assistant at Triple RC, the residential center right up the road. Uh, I want to start out with a couple things. Uh, asking everybody to sign in, please, over here on this table uh, and notify which facility you're from. Uh, and list any family members that have came for your friends. Uh, the next thing is that um, we have some flags over on the table. Uh, facing horizontal to the road that if you guys would like to plant them in front of the banner out in the grass uh, to uh, Remember somebody that we've lost in recovery. Uh, you guys can please do so at any time um, So just a little backstory on myself is I came to Oriana house in 2020 as my uh, first entry level into this field um, as a recovery coach February of 2020 uh, I did a contract through AmeriCorps um, and I did about six months with Oriana House. Uh, lo and behold, I didn't have a GED at the time, so I had to go and work on getting that to be able to come back full time. Uh, I was able to come back in August, um, so over a year ago, um, to be a recovery coach, moving up to now a lead treatment assistant. Um, I really wor enjoy working at Oriana because of the structure that they have, the, the, you know, the work that we do to help other people. Um, a lot of people that we get, uh, are low in their lives and it's just nice to see um, that we can uplift people in there and back into their homes so it's one good thing yeah and then uh about the smoking too we, we want to ask everybody to please smoke in the back section uh you know away from the food and the tables uh we also have a cigarette butt container by the uh, bushes over there so please make sure you put your butts in the container when you're done smoking so um we're going to move on and um, yeah, we're going to start with the five for five speakers uh, and the first person that's going to come up and speak is Ryan Matheny. Um, Ryan Matheny has completed the halfway house in Triple RC and is now a PRSS at Pure Solutions. <clears throat> All right, this is the second word. Uh, my name is Ryan Matheny. Uh, came here actually a couple of times. I was here in 2015. Uh, didn't take the program seriously. Uh, I was a bit of an asshole. You know, you, nobody could tell me anything. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I didn't take it seriously. And then when I came back the second time, uh, I just kind of had this perfect storm of uh, stuff that just kind of came together. And this place was actually able to save my life and, and get me back on the path that I needed to be on to get my family and my job and everything like that straightened out. But I just want you guys to know that like while you're in here and in this program, I know it's not all sunshine and puppy farts all the time. Like it gets old and it gets trying and it's going to be one of those things that kind of gets you down and out. But always stay optimistic because at the end of the day, this place is going to save you. It's going to give you the tools that you need to survive. Uh, and then when you come out, <laughs> you just got to remember that you always got to keep your recovery strong. Uh, never stop working on it. Always make time for self-care. Uh, basically just, I mean, handle your business. This is, this is an ongoing effort and it's not something that goes away over time. Uh, it's going to be one of those things like I'm going to die in, in recovery and not in active addiction. That's my goal. So. Just keep working your program, do what you guys got to do up here, and uh, try to make the best of it while you're here. 
I got just over three years clean. August 30th was my clean date. Uh, uh, sobriety has given me so much. It's unreal, man. I never thought that life could be as good as it's been. It's almost surreal, and I'm I'm still stuck in that mentality sometimes that something bad's going to come along and take it all away from me. You know what I mean? But I mean, I guess that's just one of my character defects I got to work on. But uh, yeah, I've been working as a recovery coach over in Parkersburg at Peer Solutions for a little over six months. Uh, Thoroughly enjoy helping people and, and seeing everybody like yourselves like get out there and see the light click on and to be able to go out and get the help you need and succeed. So I mean just keep buckled down and do what you gotta do here, man. I think that's about all I got. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Yeah, any questions? Yeah. Alright, the next speaker has graduated from Triple RC, the Halfway House Android course, so please welcome JT Hazley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. straight to Triple RC, then I went straight back to the Oriana house. So I know what everybody in here is going through. It sucks, but it works. So uh, my clean date is October 26, 2019. So next month I'll have three years. Yeah, I really don't know what I'm supposed to say, but so I just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I started doing drugs when I was like 13. All right. I shot up for like 12, 15 years. Uh, it's a bad spot. Everybody in here's been in a bad spot, or else you wouldn't be here, right? So, yeah, growing up sucked. Being a drug addict, I thought it was cool at the time, but yeah, turns out it sucked. <laughs> uh, yeah. But since I did Triple RC in the Oriana house, and I graduated from drug court. Uh, that was really good. Yeah, drug court sucks. You got to do all that shit that they make you do. You got to check in and whatever, all that. But I tell you what, when I left drug court, I was kind of lost. Yeah, it was, I, I don't know. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. I lost my train of thought. You weren't so used to anyways, being free? Since I've completed all that, I've gotten married. I got a baby. He just turned four months old. Me and my brother own a company that's doing really good. And yeah, we have a bunch of employees We're doing good. And I owe it all to recovery. I guess so. um, yeah, I remember when Seth came. He was my recovery coach at Triple RC. He was lost. Now he's here. <laughs> he's doing good. Um, shit, I don't know what to say, man. Like, I know everything that you guys are going through. It seems like it sucks, and that uh, half the shit is pointless. You're not going to use none of it. But I tell you what, when I got out, I used a lot of it. You know, I use it every day. You know, um, meetings really helped me out when I got out. I went to a meeting every day, sometimes two or three a day. I don't go to that many as much now because I have a company to run. I still go to meetings when I can. Um, you know, when you get out, the most important thing I can tell you is you gotta find sober support. You gotta find people that believe in you and 
you can't hang out with the same people that are using. You can't go back to that shit. It's, yeah, it's not. I, you know, I, I, I see a lot of people here I know that I used with. And I'm glad you're here. And I hope you guys make it. Yeah. And everything that they give you here is the tools you need to make it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. Recovery's not easy. Getting high is easy. Sitting at somebody else's house, doing dope every day, not worried about paying bills to take care of your family, that's easy. Uh, being out here living clean and sober, it's hard. Yeah. You don't have the drugs to deal with your emotions. You don't have the drugs to block out the problems that you got. You got to deal with them. And times are going to be hard when you get out. They're going to be really hard, especially when you first get out. It's going to seem like it's impossible to do, but it's not. Just keep your head up and keep going. Yeah, you'll make it through it. And like I was saying, you have sober people around you, somebody that you can trust and confide in. Yeah, when you're having a bad day or something, call them. Let them know. Yeah. Even if you don't want to call them because you're like, oh, man, I don't want to bother the person, you calling them might make that other person's day. Yeah. They might be having a bad day, and you calling them and asking them for help might have just help them. Uh, just, you know, keep a positive attitude and just keep sober people around you. It's, I mean, that's, that's, I can't say that enough. You know, without the people I had around me when I first got out, I wouldn't be here where I'm at now. They sure as hell wouldn't ask me to come talk. <laughs> if they would have, I probably wouldn't have showed up. So. Uh, yeah, I'm going to follow Ryan's lead and say that's all I got. <laughs> Is there any questions for JT? Okay. <laughs> all right, our next speaker is, um, has been a graduate from Triple RC and now works at Angels Harbor, so it's Michael Christian. How is everybody? I always get pretty nervous doing this. I'm not a speaker like in public, but individually, I think and tend to think that I, I help people. Um, so I just want to share briefly, I used drugs and alcohol for 23 years of my life. I was a severe opiate addict, um, seven years in the penitentiary, straight, uh, divorced, lost my kids, uh, no license, no car. When I, when I landed at treatment, the first attempt uh, over in Ohio, I had a half a trash bag full of clothes, and that's all I had to my name. Broken spirit, didn't believe in a God, just wanted to quit doing what I was doing. Um, so I went through that treatment center. I started going through that one and uh, graduated, did what I was supposed to do there. But one thing was lacking. I never fully surrendered. Um, Inside, I always knew that I was probably going to get high again. And I started putting money and girls and relationships and things like that in front of my recovery. And I fell on my face. Um, in June of 20, I overdosed for the first time on fentanyl. Uh, behind the wheel of a car, by myself. Um, it was really dangerous. I could have killed somebody. I could have killed some kid. I could have killed myself. When I come to, they hit me with five things in Narcan. The EMT was like, you know, we saved your life today. Uh, things began to change there. Um, I signed myself in at Rigel. The very next day, I landed in the men's program over at Triple RC. And uh, when I got there, I was definitely rough around the edges. Uh, very defiant, very oppositional. Uh, the first month I was there, you know, it was up and down a little bit. Um, I can remember some of these staff members, Seth, Candace, Coda, like big butthole, you know what I mean? If they said something, I had a challenge for it. I didn't want to listen. Um, so that opposition put me in a place that I got some consequences, some more consequences. They were like, you know, uh, you're not allowed to do nothing. No, no gummy bears, drop-offs, no cigarettes, no family coming to visit, no phone calls. 
what you can do after group is you can sit in this room and you can read, draw, and just be with yourself. <laughs> right? And it helped. It did help. As I've had time to process and look over the last almost three years, I'm like, man, what a blessing that was to actually get that time alone because then I started to think and I started to build a relationship with God and with myself and with my family. And I learned to set boundaries with my wife. My wife learned to set boundaries with me, my children. Um, fast forward a little bit, I graduated. They sent me on my way. Um, I left out of treatment on an MAT, Vivitrol. I'm an advocate for Vivitrol. If you don't know anything about it, give it a shot, especially if you're a severe opiate addict. It can help in the beginning. Uh, mixed with counseling and things like that, I do want to advocate for that. Uh, fast forward, I left there. I went back to Morgan County, started working as a resident tech in the treatment center. You know, just helping guys, listening, you know, being there for people. Fast forward some more, went and got CDCA. Fast forward some more, went and got to the peer support. Fast forward some more, you know, God kept putting me in position by the people I surround myself with me. Uh, today I get a coordinate, I'm an intake coordinator for a treatment facility for females over in Vincent, Ohio. Um, I'm a part of a ministry. We just bought a house. My kids are in a good school. I got a legal driver's license. I'm a productive <laughs> member of society. Um, and I heard the guy say beforehand, the couple, it's, it's who you surround yourself with. Don't be afraid to tell on yourself. If you had negative thoughts, bad yeah. thoughts, to use and tell somebody. You know, you got to be, you got to ask for help. Um, keep that core group of people strong. You know, I'm a tr true believer in confidants. You know, we'll be lucky if we have four or five confidants in our lifetime. That is for us no matter what, whether we struggle or shine. Start relying on those people, speaking out to them, let them know what's going on. There is a better way. So uh, once again, I thank you all for letting me come down and share. Uh, if I can help in any way, you know, you can find me on social media. I'll give you my number. It don't matter. Girls, guys, if you just want to talk, like, it's what it's talk. It's not about business. It's about an outcome. You know what I mean? Like, we want to see people recover, especially this whole area. Um, so thank you for letting me share. Y'all have a wonderful day. <clears throat> Is there any questions for Micah? All right, so our last speaker, I just met him before the recovery event. He said he likes to talk, so uh, hopefully we have some good story from him as well. He's a um, former director of NAMI, and uh, he's going to be providing music for us today as well. So please give it up for Paul Quinn. Thank you. I could hardly wait to hear what I have to say myself. Um, so are, are you familiar with NAMI, the Na National Alliance on Mental Illness? Yeah. That was kind of my entree. Uh, I come from a, a large family. Uh, I'd say there's 150 of us, but it's really only nine, but it feels like 150. <laughs> my, my mom still doesn't know my name. She's like, hey, she just starts with the oldest and figures she'll hit me eventually. Hey, Gretchen, Tom, Carolyn, Charlie, which one are you? Don't lie, so I'll find out who you are. I'd like take you out and make another one look just like you. We wouldn't even miss you. But anyway, um, the uh, youngest of all of us, uh, my, I don't, I don't want to call him my little brother because he's about 6'4", 6'5", like 300 pounds. That's my dude. Uh, but the, the youngest of all of us, um, at age 15, um, started taking on a completely different personality. He'd always been popular in school, a good athlete. Uh, did well in school and he started getting in fights he dropped out of sports became antisocial, and we didn't really know what to make of it uh, I was always particularly close to him for whatever reason and uh, he turned his back on me and I didn't understand what he was going through so I figured well whatever your problem is buddy I got it right back at you so screw you and, and I had no idea what he was going through uh, ultimately after about five years of floundering, uh, we finally got a diagnosis of schizophrenia. 
and he has worked every day since then. This is now 30 some years later, and he works every day on his recovery and trying to help others with theirs. And he's doing better than he's ever done. And uh, so that was kind of my introduction to all this. Um, of course, now in the meantime, over the last 30 years, I've learned that uh, mental illness and addiction are very closely aligned, if you don't know this. Really, it all comes down to your brain chemistry. We're all a little bit off somehow. I mean, and we're all looking for a place where I call it, we feel level. I don't know, just, you know, when you don't feel right, you feel anxious and you're not sure what it is. You need to feel like you need a cigarette or you need a drink or whatever it might be. I think is where a lot of this comes from, where we're looking for like a peace of mind, a place where we just feel comfortable and, or level, I like to say. And um, in that process, a lot of times we try different things. Um, I know people who even do things that I suppose you could consider healthy. I know somebody that runs five miles a day. And if they don't get in their five mile run, they're a mess. You don't want to be around them because they're grouchy. You know, they're real irritable. So you might think that's healthy. To me, it's still extreme. It still shows they're off balance. Um, I have a brother who's a health nut. And like, you know, he, his daughter's now over 30 years old and he still stands over and better get some more greens on your plate there. I'm like, to me, that's extreme too. But um, is it a mental illness? Probably. I think we're all crazy at some level. You know, they talk about people with autism on a scale. I think that's how we ought to talk about everybody. Okay, how stable are you given your, whatever your craziness is? Uh, be probably a more realistic way to look at it. Who do you know who's normal? Well, let's see. Let's see a show of hand of normal people. We got I, one here. I have totally AJ. Normal. Yeah. I'm totally AJ normal. AJ's definitely a poster child for normal up here. Right. Uh, I'm just real quick. I met AJ. Uh, I lived in Columbus for 30 years and raised my kids there and uh, played music there. And I moved back home to my hometown of Zanesville and I was looking around to play some music. I, I've been a drummer all my life. And uh, ended up at the last minute, uh, AJ had some studio time booked and a drummer didn't show. So somebody called me and said, hey, you want to come down and play drums with this guy? I'm like, sure. Never met him, never heard his songs or anything, but sat down, he started playing, I started playing, and it just worked. And uh, so at the end of the session, he said, hey, that, that's, we sounded pretty good. You want to be my drummer? I said, hell no. <laughs> You're the same age as my kids. I'd have to feel like I was your dad, and I'd be watching over you. And that's pretty much what happened. Three years later, oh, I said, uh, I'll, I'll be your drummer until you find one. And so three years later, we're still doing it. And uh, anyway, it's turned out to be a, a, a great experience and, and a good relationship. And happy to be here. But uh, I do have a, a recovery story of my own. Um, I've had nine surgeries on my back and hands and neck over the last 30 years. And um, when I first told my doctor about it, he said, well, uh, we have a miracle pain reliever. It's non-addictive called Percocet. Ha <laughs> <laughs> uh, So I mean, he gave me like 10 pills or something. And I, I just stuck them in the medicine cabinet and forgot about them. And I thought, well, you know, I do have this pain. And the doctor did prescribed that and you know he did that for a reason I guess I should take them so I started taking them but uh, when I returned to the doctor I'd say you know I still have persistent pain well I'll, I'll up your prescription and we followed that pattern for the next 20 years every time I'd see him I'd say, well, I still have pain well I'll up your prescription to where I was getting I think 250 uh, 10 milligram Percocet a month and thing was I still had pain and uh, in the meantime all this research comes out and says all oh, this stuff that we said was uh, non-addictive uh, it's highly addictive and it changes your personality oh great <laughs> now that I'm into these for a couple hundred a month uh, so I went to my doctor I said you know what I don't want to keep taking all these pills so, okay I understand that well I'll tell you what instead of giving you a uh, this Percocet, I'll give you a, what's the next one up? This is more powerful. Oxycontin. Oxycontin. We'll give you Oxycontin. I was like, wait a minute now. Uh, isn't that stronger than Percocet? Yeah, well, you said you don't want to take all those pills. 
you, you take six of those a day, you only take two of the Oxycontin. Like, uh, that's not exactly what I was going for. I don't want to take any pills. Oh, liquid morphine. Okay, yeah, we can hook you up with that. Like, jeez. <laughs> I don't want to take anything. Huh? I don't want to take anything. Oh. Okay. Well, wean yourself off. And he walked away. Like, wean myself off how? I don't know. Well, fuck it. I quit right now. <laughs> so, I, I had no idea what I was signing on for, but I knew I quit right there. Uh, a couple of days later, a buddy of mine calls. Hey, how you doing? I'm like, man, something's wrong with me. He said, why is that? I'm like, I... I spent the whole night rolling around on my parents' living room floor like a fish out of water, bouncing from one end of the room to the other. He's like, well, didn't you say you were quitting those uh, Percocet cold turkey? I said, yeah. Well, you dumbass, that's called withdrawal. Like, okay, well, I didn't know. So I do now, but I quit that day. I never looked back, never taken another one, never attempted to. But I know most people can't do that. And one thing I've learned is it does. It takes a plan. And you're probably working on that. It takes a plan to stay sober. So when you get triggered, first of all, you've got to know what your triggers are, so you can try to avoid those. And but when you do get triggered, you got to have a plan. Because if you don't have a plan, you're going to do what you always did. And so your plan needs to be: Who can I call that I know will back me up? Where can I go? You know, what resources do I have available to me? And, and you have to have all that ready. Because when the time comes, you can't be, oh, I feel like using right now. Let's see, who can I call? Geez, I don't know. My dad, no, he wouldn't, he, he's pissed off. Oh, my mom, no, she won't talk to me. No. That's not the time for that. Because you'll say, screw it. You know, give me the drug. So you got to have all that planned out. And if you don't know what your triggers are, the best thing I could tell you is to journal. So you can see... When you feel like using, you'll, you, over time you'll see a pattern and um, you'll be able to better identify when you might have one coming. But you got to stay away from the, the places, people, and things that make you want to use. I know a lot of people associate certain things with the, with the cigarettes or drug use. It's like, you know, after a specific activity or you're with a certain person or in a certain place and you got to try to stay away from those or guarantee you'll be triggered but the biggest thing I see and and doing a lot of volunteer work over the last 30 years with people is too many people are just waiting to be saved or they're just bluffing their way through the program so they get back to doing what they were doing before and you have to be responsible and in charge of your recovery nobody else can do it for you we can't want it bad enough for you I talked to so many family members who say I would give anything for my loved one to get clean, but they just can't do it. It's like, well, are they committed to the program? Like, well, I'm, I'm not so sure. So, well, if, if you're not committed to it, you can't expect anybody else to care. But, um, so you have to own it. And the good news is the treatments are better than ever. The success right now for people going through addiction or, or, or mental illness or any kind of brain disorder, the success rate when you get treatment is higher than any other disease or illness. It's like 90% success rate. The next best is like heart disease is like 80% success rate now. So your chances of recovery are outstanding, but you got to commit yourself to it and have a plan. So when you get triggered, you know exactly who to call or where to go or what to do. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention. If I can be of help, I'll be hanging out today. So uh, holler at me. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Paul? All right, before our next event, uh, we have a special group of people who want to come up and give a special message to uh, a very special person that we've lost recently in recovery. Uh, so we're going to allow some time for this group of people to share their message to you guys. They ask if we get the other back here in the As he said, it's very special. My name is Dam and I'm an addict. I'm loud. Yeah, I got you.
Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. My name is Sam, and I'm an addict. I'm this Dustin, I'm an addict. I'm Ryan, I'm an addict. Dan, an addict. We are friends of Eric Jenkins. Eric Jenkins lost his life to heroin this year. He was a really close friend to all of us. He just graduated drug court. He'd been in triple RC several times. Many of you may know him, many of you may not. <coughs> but two days after he graduated drug court, he was found dead in his apartment of a drug overdose. As all of us, as his friends, he didn't reach out to us. And we get it because we're addicts too. Eric was like a definitely for me a it's big a brother that I never had. Um, me and Eric had a rocky relationship when me and him first met. Like definitely a trip R C because I mean him. Me and him went through trip R C and then the halfway house together. Me and him didn't really start getting close until we got into the halfway house. And he was always there for me and it was hard when we lost him and we just want feel like it's a good thing to present to let people know that they're just to reach out because like you never know that last that one time used to be your last and uh like for me like i'm still in the drug court program with a couple of the people here and uh i actually graduated at the end of the, this month and i'll be doing a memorial bench for him that's going to be going out front here for eric because that's how much eric meant to me so uh but that, that's all I've got. You guys got anything? Uh, like we said at the beginning, my name's Dan. Um, I met Eric through Triple RC and Rigel. Um, Eric was the great example of someone that knew NA and AIA by the book. Um, he had all the knowledge in the world to offer to other people and to give them advice. Um, Eric reminded me time after time to. Um, you know, always reach out, um, you know, if I had something bother me to open up and talk to someone about it. But Eric was a great example of, um, you know, he, he could give the advice, but we all knew he was struggling with his own demons and his own problems. Um, so not reaching out and, you know, not opening up about what's truly going on in the inside. Um, can result in you know that one time using one more time and that one more time can be your last use so um you know all i got to say is if you have an issue or are struggling um open up find someone in the recovery life that you can talk to that you trust um, because opening up might be the you know one decision that saves you from relapsing um it's helped me out many a times um so if we can have a moment of silence to honor Eric Jenkins, um, we'll appreciate that. I had a good time. Oh, uh -huh.